Hello, and welcome to part two of lecture four from aerospace propulsion. So, hopefully you took a minute to think about some of the advantages and disadvantages of spark ignition engines for aerospace applications. So some of the advantages is they have, these engines have very good transient response. This is because they have a relatively low amount of rotating mass. This is also one of the reasons why spark ignition engines are so popular in automobiles, is they have very good transient response. Right, it's very easy um, to quickly change the rotating speed of the engine. So that's an advantage. Um, another is that noise suppression um, and noise reduction are relatively easy to do with these engines because the exhaust, which is most of the source of the noise, is not the source of propulsion, as opposed to a jet engine where the exhaust jet is exactly the source of propulsion. So we can't just sort of break up that jet because then we would achieve no propulsion. But with a, with a spark ignition engine, that's not a problem. It's also relatively easy to mount these engines on the fuselage or the wings, um, and they're relatively easy to surface, service because uh, the parts are not sort of hidden inside of a nacelle. But there's significant disadvantages to these engines too. Um, there's a lot, a lot of parts uh, to these engines, and so they require frequent inspection. So there's the ignition systems, fueling systems, lubrication, the valve train. Um, there's also a more than linear increase of mass and complexity as the power goes up. So these engines don't scale up well to very large power requirements. They also typically have a somewhat of a dependence uh, of performance on altitude, um, although using turbocharging or supercharging can overcome this to some extent. And you need a large diameter propeller for large engine powers, um, and that requires a gearbox to reduce the rotational speed, which adds weight and complexity. So some of the general characteristics of spark ignition aero engines are that these are typically constructed to be very light. So they're made of uh, aluminum or magnesium alloys, and sometimes made partially with composite materials. And they typically have a relatively large number of cylinders um, and that's to help with uh, safety in terms of redundancy. They typically have high mean and peak pressures um, and therefore typically need high octane fuels that don't auto ignite easily. One thing that it may not be obvious that's a big difference from a car engine is they have to rely uh, reliably operate at a vari variety of spatial orientations. So you can't basically rely on gravity to do any of the work for you which is certainly not the case in uh, the engine that you might put in a car, right? So an aircraft could be maneuvering in all sorts of ways and the engine has to work regardless. So the fuel system and the lubrication systems have to be constructed and designed in such a way that they operate uh, independently of spatial orientation. These engines also typically need a special cooling system um, if they're liquid cooled. Um, the coolant needs a high boiling point and a low pressure, and you need to prevent excess boiling at low power conditions where there's not that much cooling to do, um, for example, during descent. So um, actually designing the cooling systems can be, can be a, a, a quite a challenge. As mentioned earlier, we need re uh, reliable performance at all altitudes, um, and we can achieve this with a cylinder pressure boosting system. So typically we'll have a radio compressor in, in the inlet, you saw in the, in the radial engine with the sleeve valves, that wasn't possible, right? So that would have really limited the, the high altitude uh, performance of such an, air, an aircraft with that engine. Um, but uh, nowadays it's more common to have typical inlet systems where you can put radio compressors in to raise the pressure either through turbocharging or supercharging and often also use intercooling to improve the efficiency of the cycle. Another huge difference from uh, the engine in your car is the absolute requirements for reliability and uninterrupted operation. You know, if your engine breaks down in your car when you're on the highway, you pull over to the side of the road and you call CAA, um, in an aircraft, that's a little bit of a bigger problem. So there's redundancy built into these engines. It's just not there in other applications. So typically there'll be two park spark plugs per cylinder. Each powered by two completely independent ignition systems so that if either of those sets of systems fails the engine can continue to operate without any issues at all. There'll be a lot more in-engine component temperature monitoring um, and you'll need heated air filters to prevent the air filters icing up at altitude or when flying through clouds um, 
and there'll be extensive real-time onboard uh, engine diagnostics and monitoring to make sure everything's working properly and provide the earliest possible indicators of any problems. We also need to have a relatively high overall efficiency um, to keep fuel consumption down. Um, so we'll typically again have this gearbox to reduce the rotational speed to get optimal propeller thrust um, and a useful diameter for the propeller. Now, for one of these engines to operate um, and for, to be able to maintain a flight condition, the power available from the engine um, propeller combination must be greater than or equal to the power required. So here we see um, a schematic illustration of how this works in practice. So the curves uh, that are concave down uh, indicate these sort of power available curves. The upper one would be maybe a wide open throttle configuration and the one that looks similar but is lower down would be at a partially open throttle configuration. And this increases up to some point um, with sort of engine speed, um, but eventually starts dropping off because friction uh, and other losses start to uh, rise faster than the, the work output. Um, and the concave up curve is the power required to maintain a, a given flight condition. Where the wide open throttle curves and the power required curves intersect tells you the maximum possible speed at which the aircraft can fly. Now in terms of that power required curve, what's governing this, right? So we have this increasing propeller power required with aircraft speed. How would you expect that to scale quantitatively? And how is it related to the forces that act on the aircraft? So think about this for a few minutes and try to come up with an answer for yourself before you move on to the next part of the video.